So, last speaker, thank you all for uh, joining this presentation. And uh, thanks for the previous speaker to uh, touch upon the Rabobank uh, security baseline. Didn't see it, but it was mentioned that uh, it was on the screen. Um, I work at Rabobank. I'm one of the two security officers in the room. <laughs> uh, Thijs is the other one, uh, which I brought with me today. Uh, well, I work at uh, Payment Solutions Domain, so I work with many Agile and DevOps teams uh, well, creating payment solutions and uh, fintech applications. Um, but I'm not talking about that today. I'm, today I'm talking about uh, our journey to Rabobank Agile in, uh, security in Agile and uh, DevOps. Um, I added control shift left because the previous speaker said shift left and we in Rabobank we created the term control shift left uh, because we also agree that security needs to be part of the uh, continuous delivery process and as early as possible. Um, so control shift left. Um, I used to present this uh, to a lot of product managers and uh, people who are not that familiar with, uh, with Agile. Um, I think I can skip this one right here. Uh, but I do want to ask you some questions as in uh, who works with, within an Agile or DevOps team? Quite a lot. Who knows their security officer at the company? Oh, it's quite a lot. I'm actually quite surprised. Um, who keeps regular in touch with the security officer at our teams? Oh, okay, it's uh, grows less. Okay, thanks. Um, well, at Rabobank, we adopted the vision to uh, decrease time to market, to improve efficiency and blah, 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 to uh, in actually implement Agile, and uh, we want to continuously deliver new features. Uh, we from the security office were, uh, well, part of creating this, uh, this vision at the end of the process, unfortunately. So that's why we added the end of this quote. Uh, we do not want to make any concessions to the security of the services uh, delivered. We have a lot of uh, uh, high, uh, high payment applications processing uh, millions of transactions during the day. Uh, so we do want to improve them and make it more agile, but we do not want to make any concessions of the security. Um, so what? Uh, what did we do? Well, we as security officers were asked, okay, we want to go to DevOps and Agile, and you need to facilitate this from a security point of view. So what did we do as a good security officer as we are? We focused on what are the actual risks while introducing DevOps or working in a DevOps environment. Uh, so I quickly touch upon what we, what we saw as the main risks, and luckily we didn't, um, oh, Come up, came up with these risks uh, ourselves, but we discussed that with many of our, uh, our, our Agile teams. First risk is fraud. <laughs> uh, it's a very convenient risk that we run a lot of payment applications. Uh, so one of the key risks in our uh, IT infra or IT uh, systems uh, development is that we need to prevent fraud uh, or backdoors or mistakes in the code. So that was one of the key risks which, that we needed to take a look at in, uh, in our DevOps or Agile way of security. Second is a rapid delivery of new features can also mean rapid delivery of mistakes. So we thought we needed to look at how can we prevent rapid delivery of mistakes. That was our uh, second risk. Third risk is uh, data exposure. We have a lot of uh, privacy sensitive customer data and a lot of uh, confidential business data, of course, from large corporates uh, and, and stuff. And with GDPR, <laughs> uh, we are also busy, very busy with uh, GDPR. So yes, we also had a risk of data exposure and also DevOps changed the way we dealt with that part. Uh, unauthorized access. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you had uh, segre segregation of duties implemented at your company. See, can I see hands? Yeah, okay. We actually call it segregation of duties is dead because in Dev, within DevOps, everybody wants to have the same access rules. So our DevOps department had the same access rules. So we needed to deal with that part uh, as well. And last but not least, and this is my favorite one, is, which is actually security depth in time. Uh, why is this a risk? Well, we heavily relied upon the system security baseline process or manual penetration testing to test whether the security settings have been configured uh, quite well. Um, those penetration tests, I'm not sure how many of you perform penetration tests actually, but they tend to take some time. <laughs> Same goes for the system security baseline processes. Well, security depth in time basically means that if you deploy uh, new features every three weeks, you cannot perform a full uh, system security baseline or penetration test every three weeks. Uh, and at the end of the day, every time uh, a new deployment or the change is made uh, in an agile way of working, it was always stated that this is a small chain, so it doesn't need to have a, a, a penetration test. Um, but if you can fig yeah, figure that out, if you have like 
60 small changes during a period of so many weeks, then in the end of the day, it's a big change to the application. So we needed to do something with this. Um, so luckily, we uh, sat together with uh, many architects, uh, many uh, <laughs> architects, uh, DevOps teams, and actually product owners as well. And we, we were asked ourselves, okay, how can we facilitate this change to DevOps? Uh, then we started focusing, okay, what is one of the key principles of DevOps? And one of the key principles I think is very important is that uh, we are shifting responsibility back to the teams. Uh, the teams will. Um, uh, will become more responsible for uh, for things that were previously handled by delivery managers and stuff. So we also thought, well, if we can emphasize that security is a key responsibility of the team, then we as security officer need to change our way of working as well. So we didn't come up with a uh, uh, strict rule book of policies, but we came up with six uh, DevOps security principles at first. And those six security principles, they are related to those uh, risks we defined in the DevOps uh, DevOps kickoff meetings, and I'll quickly uh, go through those uh, DevOps security principles and add an example of each of them. Um, what I do need to mention is that these risks are not new, and that was something we realized as well. We're changing to an agile and DevOps way of working, but the risks are were present already during uh, well when we started with IT uh, so many years ago. So these risks are not that new. Maybe rapid delivery is, but the other ones were not that new. Uh, so what changes was the way how we need to deal with those risks. So the first risk, our first principle is maintain code integrity, including an audit trail of code changes. Basically what this says is that if you create a new piece of code, and if you, uh, together with uh, two pair of developers, and you create a piece of code, and then you upload it in, uh, into the test, uh, testing uh, street, so we have a test deployment lane with uh, automated test uh, streets, etc. Please make sure that by tooling or by other means of enforcement, uh, that that piece of code that you have tested is actually going into production. This is actually related to preventing mistakes and preventing fraud. The second principle is enforce four eyes for every change to production. Uh, what does this mean? This is actually our answer uh, to the change of having no segregation of duties, uh, but instead we are going to rely on segregation of tasks. So uh, in this well, very high level example, you see, uh, uh, let's call her Sarah. Sarah is our developer, and she is uh, authorized to perform every step in the entire deployment lane. So she's authorized to code, she's authorized to perform tests, uh, she's authorized on the release uh, uh, application, and she's also uh, authorized to perform a deployment. So what do we need to do? We need to enforce within tooling, within, within our tooling or deployment lanes, that uh, at the end of the day, it's not only Sarah that has been uh, working on that piece of code. So what we enforced with uh, tooling is that uh, Joe, the developer, um, has performed a peer review or is a mandatory code change, a mandatory peer review at the early stages of uh, development. So this is our direct answer in relation to segregation of duties. Yeah. This, this principle is, is uh, this was actually a chance for security as well, because previously we used to work with uh, manual penetration testing and code reviews, yeah, they were performed, but maybe once in six months uh, from a security perspective. So we saw this as a chance as well. Within DevOps, we also focused on automating of uh, security code uh, scans and stuff. So we will, for instance, work with uh, Fortify. I'm not saying that we're uh, fully uh, 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 fully well working with Fortify, but we are working with Verify and learn Fortify and learning that one as well. Uh, so one of the principles is that we ask the teams to uh, either implement Fortify or any other code school, but that they need to perform some sort of security testing. Something that I forgot to mention is that these security principles, um, the way we work with them is that uh, we ask the teams to come up with uh, an implementation of the principles. So we do not say, okay, you need to perform, uh, to, to perform uh, a code scan by Fortify, but we say, okay, you need to uh, automate security testing as much as possible, show us how you do this. So then we rely the responsibility back to the teams, and then they discuss with us as a security officer how they're performing the, or actually uh, applying these principles. Reduce impact by release methodology. Well, this is basically um, um, more related to our new agile and, and, and uh, agile developed applications. So we, uh, we we have a lot of applications that are very much older than I am, uh, which you do not want to have uh, agile implementation. But we also have our front end, uh, our mobile apps, and therefore we heavily focus on uh, the principle as in. 
canary releasing. Um, I think you all know canary releasing, so I'm not uh, touching upon that part. Yes, this was actually, uh, th this was a difficult one, uh, especially because when we started working on DevOps and uh, the DevOps uh, security blueprint, as we call it, uh, GDPR came into pr practice. So we also needed to uh, focus on how can we prevent unauthorized data access in line with uh, GDPR. So what we did was we looked at uh, our uh, we, we took a step back as in, okay, why do you need to go to production? Or well, mainly it was uh, by an incident or by a change. So what we did was we uh, said, okay, every access to production is considered as privileged. So then we can uh, make sure that we always have a reason to work with, for instance, personal data. Uh, this is one of the key principles uh, f from our DevOps blueprint. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not saying that we're there yet, but we're heavily investing on platforms such as uh, CyberArk or any other tooling that you can easily gain privileged access as a DevOps team to go to the production environment. Second part of this principle was that we also asked the teams and they came up with quite a good uh, implementation of how do you treat personal identifiable data in test environments. Well, our principle was no personal identifiable data in test environments. Uh, I'm not sure how big uh, your organizations are, but <laughs> it's very difficult to implement that. And we heavily invest invested in pseudonymization, data pseudonymization. So uh, we have chain testing. Uh, chain testing is, for instance, if you have a large payment uh, chain from uh, receiving the payment to actually uh, processing it, um, uh, for, for instance, uh, towards Swift, uh, you want to make sure that the entire chain is also tested. And that heavily relies on, for instance, account, account numbers and names. Uh, so what did the pseudonymization team did? They created the tool or used it, uh, implemented the tool to uh, change anything into plant names. So every <laughs> customer has a uh, plant name and uh, it's actually with a cryptographic technique switched to towards a uh, Latin plant name. Um, yeah, last but not least, in DevOps, we also need to uh, uh, protect the teams. If we're relying, uh, if relying on the responsibility of the team to implement uh, uh, security measures, we also need to make sure that we can protect them against themselves. So if uh, the previous speaker said it as well, log everything, because with logging, and if you protect the logging for uh, malicious tampering, you can always uh, show why did you uh, uh, made a decision, and why did you, for instance, skip the code test, and who was involved, etc. So this is a principle really to protect the uh, teams as well. Um, so what we uh, came up, we came up with these DevOps security principles and a lot of teams worked with us to uh, tr well, implement their deployment pipeline and they said, okay, can you help us and see whether we can, uh, whether we uh, apply these principles up right. And I work with, work with a lot of teams that uh, uh, where we had those discussions, but mainly what most of the teams said was, um, this is very nice, but these are all security principles that are very much focused on working on the product. And I always relate this to uh, a garage eh, where you could, uh, when you need to fix your car. The DevOps security pol uh, principles were mo uh, mostly focused on uh, securing the garage. So did you implement the right uh, certificates on the bridge eh, where you uh, can upload, or upload the car? Uh, do you have uh, the right certificates for the employees? And do you have two people working on the brakes? So I've always relayed the security principles towards the uh, garage and the environment. So what we missed, and a lot of uh, teams um, heavily uh, asked me, okay, we need to uh, have something for that as well, is the security of the product. So what are the quality standards of the windows or what security measures do we need to implement to those cars? So that's when we thought, okay, uh, without this, we cannot ensure secure system engineering. So we needed to come up with a new way of working uh, to perform the security of the car. That's, and um, before we can elaborate on what is actually the security, uh, what, what the new way of working is from the security of the car, I'll quickly highlight at what did we previously do. And the other speakers already set up on it. We also had a very mature availability, integrity, and uh, confidentiality model, where we defined every asset of Rabobank. So every asset has an uh, AIC classification, because our American uh, partners do not want to use the CIA term. Um, so we have an AIC classification of every asset. By that classification, you'll receive a large spreadsheet of 60, 70 security requirements that you need to comply to. Uh, the number of requirements is, is obviously related to the criticality based upon the ASC classification. So what happened in practice 
is that every time you have a new application, you need to perform a full system security baseline assessment, which is the, you need to fill all the secu system security requirements. What happened in practice is that uh, with the Agile teams, they said, okay, um, I'm a product owner, uh, I have a new vision of an application, and I'm going live within uh, so many weeks from now, um, but we're working on a minimum viable product. But at the end of the day, I'm working for, uh, towards a larger application. So what happened in practice, based on his vision, he received an ASC classification, and we said before you go live that you need to perform a full system security baseline check and uh, impl uh, update all the answers uh, on the security requirements. So the product owner got that, I always say 1,000 kilogram uh, PBI, uh, backlog item, <laughs> and uh, he went back to his team, and the team said, yeah, okay, nice uh, Excel spreadsheet with security requirements, uh, totally not relevant for now because we're working on a minimum viable product. Uh, we do not understand what the security measures mean. Uh, we do not speak the same language as the security officers. So the product owner was like, yeah, it doesn't add any business value. My team doesn't understand what it is, so what happened, obviously, it was shifted to the end of the backlog. So uh, I'm not only speak for myself, but the security officers at Rabobank, we were always called one week before go live, and then uh, we were they, uh, the product owner said, hey, uh, we created a nice new application, can you perform a full system security baseline check? Yeah, of course, when are you going live? Yeah, two or three days from now, and then we obviously need to do a full uh, assessment in a day where we focused on, okay, what did you not implement and what open risks do we have and how worst is that and do we need to have an escalation? And obviously the product owner, the team always said, oh, did you mean this by when we explained what the security requirements meant? And uh, obviously nobody was happy with that process because we were always focusing on what went wrong. And the product owner always needed to uh, facilitate a risk acceptance process and uh, we had you have gaps in the application landscape. Uh, so this waterfall-based application uh, sec system security baseline, we needed to change that. Uh, also, because um, not only for new applications, but for existing applications, as I previously mentioned, we ask to update the system security baseline every big change. Well, I already explained, if you're not implementing any big changes, um, we'll have a reassessment every three years because you didn't implement any large changes in Agile. We're looking back to the past three years, same process all over again. So we needed to change. So what did we do? Um, we, as, uh, we have a small group of uh, security officers. We actually performed a, a few open sessions with, uh, we, uh, we got a business analyst, uh, analyst uh, we got a scrum master and uh, somebody who was very involved in change management and we thought, okay, help us change towards an Agile security office. Uh, I always say from information security officer to Agile security officer, which for the Dutch, uh, it's also in, in Dutch. Uh, so we needed to change. So what did we do? Is we created a new way of working where we're trying to integrate security in the continuous delivery process of the teams. Well, it sounds very nice, but how does it work? It actually is that every system security requirement from that baseline is related to a business feature. Every system security uh, requirement has anything to do with a new business feature of the application. Uh, remote access, because we need to log in from home. Uh, ac access management, because we have profiles that we want to, uh, the customer to, uh, uh, to work in. So every security requirement can be related to a business feature. So what we did was we went through the system security baseline and we are trying to integrate that in, uh, and trying to treat them in the exact way as we currently treat uh, business requirements. So in the new scenario, a product owner has a new business requirement, and we are, uh, when he uh, receives that requirement from the, the business, uh, we are already at the table with the uh, product owners as in, okay, what are you going to do? And what is the minimum level of feature that you're currently implementing? So at that level, we're relating the system security requirements towards the new business feature. So uh, imagine that the product owner, before he is going to create uh, an application, he usually has an epic. He divides that epic in multiple user stories, and that user story is then being, um, uh, the security requirements are being added to that user story. So the security officer is happy because he's working at the early stage of the process, and the product owner is happy because he knows what he minimally needs to do to, uh, to have security, and he knows why he needs to implement security uh, because it's related to a business feature. Um, well, second part is evidence on demand, and I think that the, f the, the third 
block, which I just discussed, this is heavily uh, changing our way of working as security officers. And the last part, this is the second part of which we created together with the multiple agile teams, is more related to how can we actually integrate the security in the team tooling. Because we work with a large uh, risk governance application that no product owner has ever seen. Uh, the agile teams do definitely do not uh, uh, go to those uh, risk governance applications, only we as security officers uh, can. So um, we try to uh, see what is actually being documented in uh, the Agile way of working, and can we use that? Um, because the rumors say that uh, in Agile we're not documenting anything, uh, but I sincerely do not agree, because within Agile we're heavily documenting everything we're, we're doing, right? So we're documenting a user story, we're documenting how, the, from a technical perspective, we're going to create a user story, and we're documenting whether it's in production or not. So we focused, okay, if we can continue in such way of working, integrate security in that part, then we do not need to have our risk governance anymore. Well, that's, and our Excel spreadsheets. Um, quickly, how are we going to do so? This is a very complex picture. I promise I have a less uh, complex one afterwards. Uh, but this is actually our process flow of agile security engineering. So as I just uh, explained, the product owner receives an epic. Well, since I'm working in the payment solutions domain, I have a lot of product owners who receive an epic. We want to create a new payment application. Well, if we're going to create a new payment application, we're at the very, very early stages of this process. This is the uh, product backlog refinement uh, version where the product owner has an epic. I'm going to create a new payment application. Um, so the first epic is process payments from A to B. Second epic is I'm going to provide insight from, uh, for operations, eh, so for my business people. And the third epic is I'm going to provide insight for my customers in the outside world, for instance. Well, first things first, he's not going to provide insight to operations if we do not have process payments. So first things first is that the product owner is working on that epic process payments from A to B. So in that stage, the security officer is, always, is already involved. So the security officer says, okay, if we're going to process payments from A to B, but not providing insight to the outside world or to operations, then this is the only small set of security requirements we need to implement. So the product owner at that stage has an agreement, an informal handshake, and we add the security requirements towards those user stories. At that stage, the second stage, the product owner is, uh, has his regular refinement sessions, where they refine how they're going to implement the technical requirements, eh? what kind of interface do we, are we going to use, uh, where do we receive the data from, etc. And in that refinement se stage, they're also processing the security requirements. And we as security officers, well, I have too many teams, so I cannot always participate at every refinement session, but I'm available on request. So I often participate in those sessions to elaborate more on the security requirements. Um, in that second stage, when you decide, define how we're going to implement the security requirements, that's good enough for me. So, for instance, if they're going to create a payment interface and uh, they uh, explain how they're uh, validating the digital signatures and how they're creating digital signatures and uh, that's implemented, uh, then in the second stages, uh, in the, their own regular sprint planning, they're actually working to implement that. And I can always follow it because it's integrated in the team tooling and at the stage of development, if we uh, agreed in the early stages, you have four security requirements. And at that phase, uh, the, security of, uh, the product owner says, well, we had four security requirements, testing has been done. Uh, when we meet all those four security requirements, then I as a security officer have nothing to add. So then the security features are correctly implemented. Um, so this is the way of working, which really asks a lot of the security officer, because this is really a mindset change from the security officer not to operate at the end of the road, but to uh, heavily be available and present at the early stages. So as I previously said, control shift left. Uh, we're currently training our security officers as well, as in how can we be more agile and be more an advisor uh, instead of a controller, uh, because controlling can, all can be done by tooling. Uh, I do not want to spend time on uh, looking at spreadsheets and looking at uh, uh, did we implement uh, the right security amount of numbers. I want to spend my time as being a security advisor at the early stages so that we can uh, really uh, improve the security instead of focusing on hygiene. So how are we doing this from a tooling perspective? Well, this is um, actually 
I have a, a short movie. This is something created by a few of my payments teams. So we didn't create this ourselves, but this is how they uh, update system security controls on the backlog. So this in this phase, you can, for instance, have a new uh, uh, epic, uh, the payment interface from A to B. And when that epic is being put on the backlog, it's a high level example, of course, um, we agree that this is the minimum viable product. So at this stage, this is the discussion with the product owner, security officer, and somebody from the team. These meetings happen every uh, three or four weeks uh, in a sort of triangle meeting. Well, in Jira, because we, m many of our teams use Jira currently, you can create the uh, mandatory payment interface security controls. And as we see that these are the mandatory payment security controls for having a new payment interface. Well, in the refinement session, the teams can uh, they see this is a subtask or a user story that we need to comply with. Within the user story, we add an explanation of what we want to achieve with this requirement. And when it's too vague, I, as a security officer, participate in the refinement session to help them implement it. And then when they discussed how they're implementing it and it's closed, then you can shift it to the end of the backlog. Same happens for requirements that they are not going to implement. So for instance, this requirement is uh, logging of the interface. Product owner decided that he does not have that much time yet, uh, left. So he says, well, I'm not implementing logging at this stage. Um, we need to provide, uh, have a risk acceptance. And at this stage, at the early stage of having a discussion, we can already uh, oh, facilitate that risk acceptance. I had some nice uh, music with this movie, but um, <laughs> apparently you guys have to sing for me. Well, he documents that it's not fixed, so he needs to perform a risk acceptance. So what happens, well, we are not focusing on all these controls, but I do want to show you one additional thing that that team created for me, is that, hey, dear, dear security officer, we have a lot of, uh, of teams, and they've created a sort of dashboard of all the open system security requirements uh, currently on their backlog, and also on the closed security requirements. So instead of, uh, uh, of, of searching in my risk governance application, I can go to the team and ask, okay, what is your current status of uh, security? So why is this? called evidence on demand. Well, this is called evidence on demand because um, this, is, this shows an uh, implementation of all system security requirements at any stage of development, already when it's on the backlog, so before it's being deployed, and you have a total overview of the requirements that are in production. Well, I do agree that we're not there yet because this is still um, uh, not tested, eh? so this is treated in this exact same way as we're currently treating uh, new, user, new business user stories. Uh, be, that's why I previously asked, we're going to treat security in the same way uh, as, uh, as business features, because every business feature is also tested by, for instance, user acceptance testing. Well, this is something that uh, we're, we're currently at. We're working on automation to automatically test those system security requirements, so then we can uh, be present at the early stage to uh, add security to the new business future, and then by tooling, automatically test whether they're compliant or not. So uh, I hate the word compliant, uh, but we're still working in a regulatory, uh, highly regulated institution. Um, so this is basically what we're currently working on. And a um, lot of teams are participating with me now and we're trying to, uh, to improve our way of working together, uh, which is quite fun because uh, uh, I often hear results as, okay, you as a security officer are actually going to help us now instead of only control us. Uh, and those are really, uh, yeah, we, we had really nice meetings uh, with, uh, with the Agile teams. Um, well, as I promised, this is a slightly less uh, <laughs> uh, complicated slide. Uh, well. Thank you, and I uh, would like to answer the questions or uh, any reactions. Any questions? Uh, hello. Uh, the, uh, actually, two questions. But First is uh, when this future finished and closed, the story, 
And when later it is changed for a bug fix or something, what do you do? Do you reopen all of the security checks and code, or, or what do you do? Yeah. And the other one, do you use a shared code that is already tested and enforce it? Okay, first question. Um, it's not different that, uh, we do not treat the security requirements different as the other user stories. So if they change an, uh, or other acceptance criteria, for instance. So if they change an, uh, the, the feature and we need to validate the security requirement again, then that's being done because the feature cannot close before you validated those uh, requirements. Uh, so it's part of the acceptance testing, actually. Uh, second question, what, can, can you say that again? Uh, so for common things, do you use uh, like a shared uh, code that, uh, I mean, so for example, I have a code for a login that is tested, that is secure, and I enforce it for every team. So you cannot write your own login or whatever. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we do have uh, standard mechanisms for, for instance, access management. So we have one rubble standard uh, access management uh, platforms, if that is what you mean. So if you uh, onboard to the standard of, uh, of Rubbank, then you do not need to test those, uh, those parts indeed. Any other questions? Um, one of the complaints we often deal with in security is security is too expensive. Um, the cost of adding security to our application is, is just too much and it's out of project uh, budget. Um, can you see a point where you, the, the individual um, stories and um, security aspects will have the time tracked so that you can start to put a number on this cost? Um, I really like the idea that security costs more. Uh, I, f I strongly believe that security will cost less if you implement it at the very early stages of the development. Uh, and at, I experience that product owners uh, do want to deliver secure products, uh, but they do want to understand why they need to uh, have this security requirement as part of the user story. So with uh, what I experience with while working via this met methodology is that I, I can already at an early stage explain this is the least minimum that you really need to provide. And based on your second part of the question, um, we do not have an overview of how long the security requirements are open on the backlog, uh, but we uh, state that they are mandatory before they're going into production. So if you want to have that new feature, uh, it, it must, be, must be implemented because that's your minimum level of security requirement. So there, yeah, some are open and then uh, some are obviously accepted. Uh, we still have a risk acceptance uh, process. Uh, but what we do see is that there are most often short-term risk acceptance because they say, okay, this is a minimum viable product. We're going to, we have some room in the next uh, two sprints. Is it okay to have a risk acceptance of two or three weeks? Uh, and that's far better than we used to have, like, uh, okay, uh, uh, we have a new uh, system security baseline for three years now, so can we accept it for the next three years? <laughs> so that's the shift that we already made. Uh. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Alex. You're welcome. <laughs>